Hello and welcome to Sample Sizes for Cell and Animal Studies. This is the Bird Corps Special Topics Talk 8. I'm Mark Williamson for Dakota at the University of North Dakota. Let's dial in to our goal. I want this talk to help you untangle sample size for animal and cell studies, which can be pretty tricky to do. So to accomplish such things, we'll cover the following topics. Experimental design. Experimental unit, defining that, what that even is. Cell and animal specific considerations. Additional considerations. The so on and so forth of all. Methods for sample size calculation. And some quick examples. So before moving on, please take a moment to buzz through the pretest. The link can be found in the description here and in the video description below. So our first task is design with the goal in mind. So fundamentally, your number of samples depends on the question you're trying to answer. There really is no one size fits all. It will depend on what you're trying to do. So a good starting point is asking yourselves, what is the population of focus? So in a cell example, maybe you care about the response of individual cells or individual cell populations or cells across time or different types of cells. Maybe this is normal, this is breast cancer cells, and this is colorectal, the, the cancer of this area cells. Another question you can ask yourself to figure out what you're trying to answer is, are your samples representative? Because remember, things like cell lines are rather unnatural. They're immortalized, they can be sentient, sentient not sentient, sentient, and uh, they're usually monocultures. So looking how individual cells like here react to a treatment could have no real useful bearings on reducing colorectal cancer deaths in humans. Similarly, comparing the effects of a treatment in a single mouse and a tumor across several time points may tell you of the effect of a treatment on one mouse, but it won't tell you the general effect of such a treatment drug on cancer tumors in general. So you need to keep those in mind. Furthermore, what is the day in and day out reality of your experiment? Your design should capture as broad of a swath of reality as possible, because often there are reasons why you have experiments across multiple time points like we have here, or even just conditions, because we want to be able to generalize to the broader world, which is messy and complicated. So accounting for day in and day out variation uh, in the reality of your system will help you have more ro robust results. You don't want to just cure cancer in a petri dish. You want to cure cancers in reality. So one way of answering such questions are designing your experiments well. So you want to be able to craft your design to actually focus on and answer your research questions while covering representative samples that account for all sorts of representative and robust situations. It's, it's often useful to sketch out your design either informally or through say a formal method like the Experimental Design Assistant Visualization EDA shown here. It shows the experimental details, analysis plan, practical steps. So this might be above and beyond what you need, but sketching out what you're going to be doing can really help. You also may want to take into account the levels of design. For example, maybe you have blocked examples like you have here, and there could be different blocking designs, or you might have nested samples. So why would you have different levels? Well, you can account for inherent variation of head of time, and, and we'll see some practical examples of that later. So better design leads to better statistical inference. And often with a well-designed study, you don't need as many samples as a poorly designed study. So though all the design in the world won't save you from not having enough studies, samples, if you do it wrong, but it's a good start. Now, let's have a note here on too many samples versus too few, because that, that might be on the back of your mind here. Now, in the addition to limits on time, money, and effort, too many samples are actually a partial waste of, of course, animals and cells. For example, if you subjected more mice to tumor genesis and death, 
than was needed to answer the research question, that's a waste. And you want to avoid such an outcome if possible. However, too few animals or cells is a total waste. You'll sacrifice the mice, but you didn't answer the research question at all because there wasn't enough power to tell if the outcome was significant. So this outcome should be avoided more strongly. It's worse to have an underpowered study than an overpowered study. So don't be a total waste, please. Okay, I've lectured to you. How then do we make sure we have enough samples? The answer is to define the experimental unit. Well, what, what is an experimental unit though? Let's look for it. Our task of defining the experimental unit begins with defining what replication is for our study design. Basically, our sample number is equivalent to the replication number. The more replicates, the stronger inference, the more likely our sample represents the reality of the population we care about, so the better quote unquote stats. We can't just add up replication indefinitely, however. The number of samples depends on the time, money, and effort available, so that's the drawback. But what we want to do, the key, is to determine the number of samples that give us our best bang for our buck via trade-off between statistical infer inference on one hand and resource expenditure on the other. Okay, that's replication. However, we're entering the danger zone here. Not all replication is good. There's a difference between true replication and pseudo-replication. So here's a bleeding example of pseudo-replication. Say we want to get the average height of ducks, so we measure the height of a duck, and then repeat that measurement 20 or 19 times for a total of 20 measurements. Is this true replication? No. It's not measuring different samples. It's just measuring the same duck. That is the core of what pseudo-replication is. Now, a more nuanced example. So you have a frozen tube of tumor cells. You split it out to a control and a treatment, like an anti-cancer drug, and then have microplate slides made from there and look at cell death on these slides. How many samples? You might think that there's six, but no. There's just one if you look at the tube, and at most, if you want to look at the experimental level, two. A control and a treatment. The slides are pseudo-replicates. So one way to distinguish between true and pseudo-replication is the definition of biological versus technical replicates. The duck example, the buck, duck is the biological replicate, and then the measurements are technical. And here, the cancer tube is the biological, while the slides are the technical replicates. Here's another example with mice. And we can see here that essentially technical replication is synonymous with pseudo replication. However, technical and biological replication are not the best explanations. So look at these uh, upgraded cell designs here. The first three control plates and three treatment plates, they're made all at once. And the second, they're spaced across days. So how do we explain what is biological and technical in a meaningful way. Both the designs are better than that first design, but the number of biological samples has not increased. Therefore, I suggest you, dear reader, to use the definitions of biological experimental and observation units. Bing, bing, bing. That, here we have it, our exclusive and elusive experimental unit. The experimental unit is a level at which the experimental intervention is applied. So this is our unit of replication. So in our upgraded cell studies, it is the dishes themselves. In the mouse example, here we go flowing it out here. You see in A, um, so they use B is for biological, EU experimental, U observational. You can see here that they're all the same. There's four different mice and they all get their own treatment. In here, while there's four mice, the actual experimental unit is only two because the experiment is done on the litter level. So you can see there's a difference even though the mice didn't change. Here, there's four mice, but the actual a biological and Experimental unit is eight because they're looking at the eyes, so we, and each eye is treated separately. Here, there's actually only one mice, but the experimental unit is still four because 
at four different time points, the mouse is subject to an intervention. So, wonderful. We've attained a powerful tool, the experimental unit, to determine the level with replication is true replication. Not so fast, however. There's still some criteria to make sure that replication is genuine. So these are the criteria for genuine replication. We'll use this graph as an example. One, experimental units are individually randomized to treatment conditions. So there are examples here. They can actually have uh, subgroups, like say litters or cohorts. They're still allowed, you just have to have them randomized within groups as well. Then two, treatment is independently applied to each experimental unit. So if it's on the mouse level, each mouse needs to have a different treatment. Um, even within these subgroups, and there shouldn't be any spillover. And then three, experimental units should not influence each other, so they should be independent of each other. So example, putting mice treated with, say, a behavior-modifying drug, that's their treatment, in the same cage as a control mouse, might affect the control mouse behavior too, so that's a no-no. So this is the take-home point. So throw out everything I've said so far, even the GIFs and fun pictures, if it'll get you to remember this one point. The point is, the experimental unit is the level at which the intervention is made and is the point at which replication matters. So the experimental unit is the unit of replication. Say it with me, class. Experimental unit is the unit of replication. Get it? Got it? Now, let us peer downwards into the microscope for some cell-specific considerations. What is the experimental unit for cell studies? Well, this is not canonically defined, so there's debate abroad, though it is rare that it is the cells, individual cells themselves. So some contenders for the experimental unit are independent experiments, culture wells, or whole monoclonal cell lines, and so forth. So, for example, going back to this image, you can see the different experimental units for all of them. So cells, cell cultures, experiments, cell lines. So here are my cell line guidelines to determine this. So the best setup for experimental unit is samples from unique individuals. That best captures a true population. You get tumor samples from a bunch of different patients, culture them up, and so forth. That'll give us the best capture of what we're trying to see in our population of interest, humans. Now, the second best will be samples from unique cell lines. So cell lines have less variation, but if you have different cell lines, that should still be enough. Now, an acceptable alternative is fewer samples with different days and conditions, because often you can't get more than three or more cell lines or whatever. So you can still include some variation for robustness by doing it across different times, conditions. Okay, okay, Mark, you must be asking yourself. Mark, you've, you've talked theory. Can you give me actual numbers to hang my hat on? Well, since you asked, here's some actual sample size numbers to go with. So it seems like the statistical ideal is around 30 per group. However, that's unlikely to happen in most studies. Realistically, it looks like in practice, the number of samples per group is typically in the, the single digits, so read here under 10, or as low as three. Now remember, to keep the experimental unit in mind here, this is what why the number of number per group is usually the more important way to talk about it. Say if you have five cell lines, you want to compare treatment to a control across four time points, you have a total of four cell culture wells, so five lines times two experimental groups times four time points, with five per group, so a single treatment at a single time point. Okay, where was I? All right, so the practical minimum is also three. You can't get any more, any lower than that without essentially be throwing out actual statistics. So minimum is not three, but sometimes it's the best you can do. Please don't let this be the best you can do. Do not be the minimum champion. Strive for greater. Yes. Okay. Moving on. Yes, you're right. What's that scent on the breeze? It's time for some animal-specific considerations. So what's the experimental unit for animals? We'll look at mice in particular, but this can be generalized to other animals like zebrafish, etc. 
So unlike cell studies, it is typically the individual, so the individual mouse. So, but it's not always the case. It'll depend on your experimental exposure, where you're doing your level of experiment. So some might be by the cage or maybe the litter and said, so like, say you treat the mom and look at the, the, the offspring. Now let's look at uh, a couple of specific types of mouse models used a lot in cancer studies. It's the PDX and CDX. Let's look at, they deserve their own specific guidelines. So patient derived and cell line derived xenograft models. Here's some examples here. They take tumor cells from a patient's tumor or a tumor cell line and graft them onto a mouse. So subcutaneously or, or otherwise. And let the tumor grow up, um, measure it, run treatments on the mouse, et cetera. So here, the experimental unit may be the tumor itself rather than the mouse. The mouse might just sort of be a vehicle. Also, some designs might use multiple tumors for mouse. So like it might have one on each flank. So one here, one here. Each one might be treated differently or not. So here's the difference. If, you're, if you say you have two, two tumors and you just treat them at the same time with the same thing, then, then the mouse really would be the, the experimental unit. But how? say one is just a, a control and the other is say a treatment well then the experimental unit would be the tumor itself and then you could block or sort of control the random variation for mouse in your design so that's why it's important to pay attention to the levels you know you're at the mouse level or tumor level, level etc okay again like we did for cell studies let's gnaw on some actual numbers so a basic plan would just be 12 per group. I take this number from the rule of thumb for pilot studies. So that's that's human studies. So if you have bereft of anything else, just go with 12. However, a better and more involved pro process with only just a little bit more math is to use a resource equation model. This is used for animal research. It balances how many mice to use without being overly wasteful. And we'll see an example of this equation very soon. In either case, you need to account for the premature death of animals because you don't want to not have enough mice because some died prematurely. So, uh, the, so some, some cite 10%, I use usually 25% correction. You want to have enough mice for your experiment because otherwise that's why we can't have mice things. Okay, ready daddy then. We flogged home the point of ident identifying the experimental to unit as the unit of replication and thus sample size. But then how do we calculate sample size? That's probably what you're screaming into your monitor. How do you calculate sample size once we know our experimental unit? Well, there are three approaches I use. For some studies, I use all three. For others, only one is needed or relevant. So let's get down to it. Number one, power analysis. No, not that kind of power. Statistical power. The confidence to detect a certain effect size given a sample size and significant level. So typically power is 0.8, and signal level is 0 0.05. We're not gonna get too much into that, but those are the standards. And then you'll need an effect size. Practically one will estimate or guess effect size and use that along with the standard power and stimulus level to the required sample size. So this, this image I have here is a nomogram for a two sample test to illustrate the point. So for a power of 0 0.8, it's significant level of 0 0.05, and an effect size of one, we can see here that our sample size number is 30. You can see on this nomogram, the lower the effect size, the higher the number of samples and so forth. So there are a lot of software programs that can run power analysis. G power and R are champion options. And what's more, they are free. And I've actually done previous videos replete with examples on how to run power analysis with both these programs. So feel free to check those out in uh, the cards. So number two, resource equation model. Yes, our old friend, the resource equation model rears its head again. As I said, it's used in animal studies, so it's not actually applicable to all designs. It's really used to get the maximum minimum number of animals per group for your study. So you calculate E, which is the total number of animals minus the total number of groups, which is essentially the degrees of freedom for a novel style analysis. That's not really helpful. T take this from me here, that the minimum E is 10, which any lower the sample 
is underpowered, and the maximum is 20, which any higher it's wasting animals. So to get the total number of animals, you add E to the total number of groups. So let's rid of some of our chaff here, and we can see sort of the information we have on the research equation. So armed with group number and the attrition correction, so like 10 or 20 percent that I talked about earlier, we can calculate the minimum and maximum number of animals per group the study should have. In other words, we can get the range of our sample size per group that it should fall under. Okay, number three, a literature search. So this isn't so much power analysis as it is, what are other people in my field doing and how, and am I in the same ballpark as them? So how the method works is that you search your journals for articles that have the same or similar model system, say caffeinated slugs treated with espresso, is a weird example, or that uh, then have the same or similar experimental design, so a treatment arm for the slugs and a control arm for the slugs who get green tea, and then pull out the number of samples per group and the number of groups. So here, an example I have here that I've done before, I don't know why I use the weird slug example of a perfectly reasonable pure neural invasion of mouse models, but whatever. We can found uh, with the three studies, some in multiple experiments, we can see the lowest was five per group, well, the highest was 10, 10 per group. You know, in fact, you could even calculate the average number per group in all these studies, but I'll leave that to the over-caffeinated slugs among you to work that out among yourselves. So the rationale behind the literature search is thus. Let's take a line here from Aristotle. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, you just thought I was all puns, means, and gifs, didn't you? Well, I've got to keep you on your toe with some of the classics. Anyways, a literature search help us to understand the mean for such studies, the balance, as you will, and not err towards the vice of a weak study, so too few, or a wasteful study, too many samples. Mm-hmm, starting to round the bases here. Some additional considerations for your viewing pleasure. So increasing sample size increases power but increasing sample size is not always possible. So here are some ways to increase power without increasing sample size. Again, not this kind of power. Charles Atlas, your iconic ad was a nice try, but we'll get ripped when it's workout time. Right now, it's statistics time, so, so please get out of here. Where was I? Okay, yes, yes, increasing statistical power. So here are four ways. First, fewer factor levels for continuous predictors. What this means here is, say you have uh, outcome and dose, and you're splitting your dose up, which is continuous, into discrete sort of levels. Using less levels will have stronger power than having more levels, weaker power here. Similarly, if you have a focused hypothesis test, that will give you better results. So if you ask something like a trend test here, which is, is there a trend as opposed to a generic ANOVA is at, le is at least one group difference. You can see that even across a number of groups, the trend test is stronger, especially as you increase the, increase the number of groups. Okay, so another thing you can do is not dichotomize or bin continuous variables. So if we show here, this is a linear regression. We can see that across X and Y. It's actually a similar linear regression, but if we split it up into four different quadrants, and did a chi-square test, it actually stops being significance when we dichotomized it. Okay, fourth, cross rather than nest factors. What that means here is, now groups will have interspecific characteristics, for example, mouse litters. Cross, you make sure each group is cross across treatment. So this group here, some are in the control, some are in the treatment, and that's the same for all groups, rather than all, all of one group in one treatment. And this helps uh, account for the characteristics in the group. So for example, say litter A were larger than average mice, just naturally. In the cross design, some of these hefty mice are both in the control and the treatment. If the design was simply nested like over here, these control hefty mice would be in the control and potentially weaken the difference between in a control and treatment of say a, say this was like a muscle building, you know. This is my muscle here, oh yeah pretty terrible. Muscle building supplement. 
it might be hard to see if there's a real effect of this treatment because you had some really hefty mice just naturally in the control group. Okay, now let's consider statistical versus clinical significance. And more generally, if you really want, you can replace, you know, clinical with like biological, if you're an obligate biologist like me. But the main point here is just because something is statistically significant doesn't mean it's clinically or biologically significant. For, for example, here, scenario two shows such a consideration. This is, this is statistically different from zero, but there is not much of a difference for a clinician to care about in trying to deal with total cholesterol alternation. Likewise, the converse is true as well. Just because something isn't significant doesn't mean it has no importance for reality. So that's scenario four here. While there's a lot of variability, so the error bars cross zero, there's a fairly large mean. So like maybe more studies could really tighten this up and this could be an effective scenario for uh, looking at total cholesterol alternation. So obviously we all want our studies to be either the excitement of scenario three or at least the cold, cold comfort of a insignificant scenario one. But reality is messier than that. It's always important to remember that statistical inference isn't the whole story. Well, okay, doki then. A brief blip on statistical design and sample size. There are more discussions to be had on specific designs. So I have some examples here, a good resource on binary data, single group analysis, time to event, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, I'll throw in some more useful examples and tidbits for free for you here. Okay, righto, righto. Next, important thing here, one of the reasons for this talk is sample size is not well reported. So is there an animal size 20%? did not report sample size, and 44% of preclinical trials out of 233 had insufficient sample size description. So maybe they had enough samples, but they didn't report it well. So don't be that person. Be clear what you did and why. That's a good touch point of uh, repeatable and reliable studies. So finally, consideration. There is actually still a place for technical replicates. They are not an unspeakable evil. As long as you are not confusing pseudo-replication with true replication, it is. So one thing it helps for is uh, reproducibility of experiment. If there's a variab variability in an assay or measurement, multiple technical replications can give a more robust measurement. And it allows for better reproducibility, as I said. Also, there, there are burgeoning ways in things like Bayesian analysis and other sorts of statistical methods to make use of even pseudo replication. So, if you want to check out this, this uh, reference here, if you want to gallop off in that direction. Okay, enough talk, more action. I'll show you some examples by talking at you. So, I guess I mooted the button. Okay, ignore the man behind the curtain. Let's just look, look at these words. So here's some power analysis for a cell line study using G power. So our first design is 12 groups, a control and a treatment. Um, I've you know, set the default alpha and power, and then a rather large effect size of 1.6. So ideally you have preliminary data or other such data to get an actual estimate of effect size, but in the face of no data, a well-informed guess is the best we can do. So the outcome we have here, total of 16. And their sample size for each group is eight. Let's have a little more complicated design here. Four groups, four time points. So this is a repeated measures ANOVA as opposed to this sort of two sample t-test earlier. Here we wanna add a few more variable values as we plug this in. I'm not gonna go into it, but we need to, I just set the default for correlation and non-sphericity. And what we get here is a sample size of 200. So what that means for us here then is there's going to be, you know, 50 per group, but then that's going to be 12.5 per group, you know, in each time period. But since we can have 12.5 people, we'll have to round up to 13 or mice. Now, 
this would be if you were measuring blood pressure at each time period you'd actually only need to have 13 individuals of mice per group so 13 times 4 that'd be 52 total but if you say we're like sacrificing the mice at each time period you need to harvest their kidneys or something you would need to again multiply this by 4 and get the total for being 208 notice this is slightly higher than this because we had to account for the fact that at the experimental unit level we had to have whole numbers spicy next let's look at a patient derived xenograph study using the resource equation model and a literature search so here's information on the resource equation i want what we i'm calling x here the number of animals per group for both the minimum and maximum e of 10 and 20. so let's uh, use four animals per group and attrition correction of 20 percent so what that means is we're going to divide by 0.8 so we have 80 percent of the animals uh, expected to survive so let's start with our um, x minimum so that's going to be our e minimum which should be 10 plus our number of groups and then divide by 0 0.80 and then our x max is going to be to be 20 that e max plus 4 5.80 to give us 17.5 and 30. so that's the total number we'll still need to divide by group so 17.5 divided by 4 and 30 divided by 4 is going to be 4.375 and 7.5 now we need whole numbers so we're going to round this up to 5 and round this up to 8 so our number of animals should be between 5 and 8 per group so let's look at a literature search this is for patient derived xenograph studies i already kind of did this earlier so there's four different studies look at different groups and we can see let's just look at the the four per group because that matches ours the best they have eight and five so based on both our tool twin tools of research equation model literature search we're pretty confident that a sample size of five to eight mice per group is going to be justifiable all right i'll wrap this up in a nice bow sample sizes depend on the research question and research design and sample size should be counted at the level of experimental unit our unit of replication now the gold sandal i say for cell studies are individual sample derived cultures if you can get it the gold sandal for animal studies are individual animals with direct intervention or maybe tumor levels if you have that specific design now actual sample size can be determined in several ways first you can just do a rule of thumb so i said three to ten cell lines or 12 animals per group you can do a power analysis with either an estimate or approximate effect size you can use the resource equation model for animal size and finally you can use a literature search looking at similar similar systems and designs as your study so thank you so much for your attention undivided or otherwise please take the post test and survey links are found in the description below as per standard, here is a trove of references used throughout this talk. In the business of trying to find out how many things you need, let sample size calculation be your guide. Lastly, as always, I am part of Dakota, and we are supported by the NIH, so please acknowledge us if you found this special topics talk useful. Thanks, and may your coffee be like your experimental design, robust with plenty replications. Thank you and good day.